Father in heaven, I thank you for the prayers that have been offered. I do ask now that you would that you would send your angels, that there would be a hedge of protection about this place, that our minds would be attuned to hear your voice, and that I would be attuned to hear your spirit. If there's something that needs to be said that may not be exactly what is on a slide, I pray if there is anything that is amiss here, that you will correct it so that people will discern that and come away with the truth and able to share that truth with others. We praise you and thank you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. All right. Well, tonight we're going to look at one verse of Scripture. And I've entitled this, The Son of David and the Son of Abraham. And the reason for that is our text here, let's see, how do we do this? There we go. Our text tonight comes from the opening verse of Matthew. There we go. And Matthew 1, verse 1 reads, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. And if you're like me, that may not look like it's very promising. You're thinking, what in the world could we say about that? However, this quotation right here may give us hope that there is indeed much to be found. Notice right here it says that the gospel is glorious because it is made up of his righteousness. It is Christ unfolded, and Christ is the gospel embodied. Every page of the New Testament scriptures shines with his light. Every text is, I like this, a diamond touched and irradiated by the divine rays. Now think about it, every text. So even some of those texts where you go through and it's just a list of names, if we study and we let God's Spirit guide us, it is in fact a diamond. The divine rays will illuminate it and we will be able to see Jesus clearly. And so that's what we're going to do with our text tonight. By the way, there's a similar quotation about the Old Testament. So both testaments are like diamonds. Now, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You might be asking yourself, what divine rays emanate from this text? And to answer that question, here's what I propose. Let's just break that verse into three parts and look at each part in turn. We're going to look at the son of Abraham. We're going to look at the son of David. And then we're going to look at that phrase, the generation of Jesus Christ. So, as far as the son of Abraham, I thought, let's just go back in Scripture here and see where Abraham is mentioned. And in Genesis 15, we have a key text. It says here that the word of the Lord came unto Abraham, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell or count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he exercised faith in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. All right. Now, for right there, let's note a couple of things that jump. Well, let me, no, no. Let me ask you. In that passage right there, what do you suppose might be some uh, important points when we're looking at the life of Abraham? In other words, not words like the, but, you know, important words. Okay, faith. And I, oh, I heard something else. Seed, okay. Air. Air, okay. Well, let's see here. What did I put? Yeah, thine heir and exercising faith. You remember that Abraham was fairly old and his wife was 10 years younger, but she was quite old as well, right? And so the promise of a child to them was, humanly speaking, way past, um, it, it couldn't happen. But notice I changed it. I didn't really change it, but I put, instead of believed, as you probably are accustomed to reading, exercising faith, I think it means the same thing, but it kind of brings it out. Belief, we think of it as sort of, sort of mental knowledge of something. Faith in the Bible is active. You need to exercise it. And that's exactly what he did. And so, another text that's helpful here, Genesis 17, verse 2. God tells Abraham, I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. My covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Notice there, covenant in all those verses, right? One of the key things about Abraham is God made a covenant with him. And he exercised faith in it. Now, as far as circumcision is concerned, we need to understand something. Yes, there is the physical act with the male children, but God's covenant is open to everyone. And when we understand things in their broadest sense, uh, these texts are helpful. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 30, it says, The Lord thy God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that thou mayest live. And again, you may be familiar with Romans 2.29, where it says that someone is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart by the Spirit and not by the letter. And again, Colossians 2.11 says, You are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So notice, God does the circumcision. He does it by His Spirit. And it says He does it without hands. Now, what's that have to do with anything? Well, we're trying to find out how, what this has to do with Jesus and what's the importance of the Son of Abraham. Well, He was the Son of Abraham because of this. He was filled with the Spirit. Would anybody dispute that? No. He was filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit wrote God's law on his heart, and therefore the covenant was fulfilled in Jesus' life as he walked by faith. Did you know that he had to walk by faith? He identified with this. He had to rely on the Father moment by moment to, to satisfy the claims of God's law, to honor him. It wasn't just some easy thing by tapping into the divinity. He had to rely on him in the manner that we do. And he showed it's possible. Uh, notice, the Bible confirms it. The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, speaking of Mary. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And he says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Isn't that fascinating? It's filled with the Spirit even from the womb. And this is, this is to be our experience. Now, we indeed can be sons, or you might say sons and daughters of Abraham as well. We want to make this a little bit practical here. So we need, just as Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, we need to be reborn, born from above. And we need to permit the Holy Spirit to fulfill the covenant in our life. There's no other way to have it done except by Him. Uh, notice this beautiful promise here in Ezekiel 36, beginning of verse 26. It says, the Lord promises, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Anybody here got a stony heart? Oh, come on. <laughs> yes. If you're not answering, it's because you're stubborn. So, yes, you have one. All right. <laughs> I will put my spirit within you, speaking for myself too, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Notice he doesn't say he'll force us, but he does say he will cause us. He has a way of arranging circumstances, of wooing us, so that the end result will be that we do that. So that's a beautiful thing. He makes us... He, he leads us to do that which is impossible in our own strength. That's about being sons of Abraham. But it said that Jesus also was a son of David, so what has that to do with anything? Well, notice, let me ask you, what comes to mind when you think of David? Uh, wait, wait, what, do you, what do you think? Oh, the life? Oh, Goliath, okay, boy, I'm not hearing, sorry. Goliath. <laughs> So, Goliath king, okay, that's kind of an obvious one, yep. Yeah. Anything else? The Psalms, yes, that's right, the sweet Psalms of Israel, okay. All of these things have to do with David. Yeah, man after God's own heart, there we go. Now, notice, uh, God made an everlasting covenant with him too, did you know that? We should think of covenant with Abraham, but he made one with, with uh, King David as well. And I think that bears on the matter. Notice right here, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 18, it says... Uh, God is speaking with him. He says, Then I will establish, or establish, the throne of thy kingdom. Talking about Solomon. According as I have covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. Okay? And again in verse 17, this is actually before it. Notice the condition. If thou, meaning Solomon, wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked. And how was that? And do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shalt observe my statutes and my judgment, then the throne will be established. So notice, there's a, co a covenant, it's a promise, but there's a condition. We have to cooperate with God. Notice what so um, Solomon says when he talks with the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 3, he makes this plea with God. He doesn't just... He doesn't simply say, well, I know that the kingdom has been given to me. I must really be somebody. No, look at his attitude. He says, give therefore thy servant, meaning Solomon himself, an understanding heart to judge thy people. 
that I may discern between good and bad. Huh. He didn't assume that he had that. He asked for it. And God's only too happy to give. We saw this text here. Notice God says, a new heart I will give you. He asked for an understanding heart, he will give it to him. He'll take away that stony heart, he will give you a heart of flesh. And notice he does it again by putting his spirit, the Holy Spirit within you, causing you to walk in your statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. So, God's covenant with Abraham and his seed, notice, was without hands. Well, the covenant with David that we're looking at right now, uh, with David's son of an everlasting kingdom, is also fulfilled without hands. I don't know if you noticed that, but it's true. The kingdom, ultimately, is the one when Jesus comes and he establishes it, and it says here that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, which will never be destroyed. It shall stand forever. For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out, the stone, the kingdom, was cut out of the mountain without hands. Same phrase. Isn't that interesting? God's kingdom is cut out without hands. And so just as with Abraham, that means that it's, it's not by anything that man does. It's done by his spirit. See, when we use our hands, we're trying to do our own way. And God says, my kingdom, my covenant has nothing to do with that. It's all me. You cooperate with me, but there's no force on your part. It's me wooing you. Okay. So God's covenant with Abraham depended on being filled with the Holy Spirit. The everlasting kingdom for David's son depended on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And guess what? We too can be sons or daughters of David as well. So what is that going to look like? Well, we need the Holy Spirit to discern good and evil, right? If Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, needed it, how much more are we? And if we are going to be members of that kingdom, God's kingdom, the heavenly kingdom that's cut out without hands, then he's going to qualify us to participate in the judgment in heaven. Remember, Solomon wanted um, wisdom to discern judgment. We too will need that as well. So we might as well ask for it now. He'll be a son, a son of David. Now the last phrase, what about this generation of Jesus Christ? Well, when you look at Matthew chapter 1, you start going through this long genealogy and you think, oh dear, that's so dry and so boring. So we're not going to read the whole thing. But notice this. It starts with Abraham begat Isaac, and then it finishes in verse 6 by saying, and Jesse begat David the king. And if you're like me and you count it up, you'll notice that there's 14 generations. That's all we're going to say about that. And then you go to the next few verses that names some more names, and it says this. Uh, David, begat, uh, David the king begat Solomon, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about that time they were carried away into Babylon. And again, if you count, you will discover there are 14 generations. Okay, and you're thinking, well, okay, so what? Well, the next slide. If you do the same thing for verses 12 through 16, it says, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Okay, so now we've gotten to Jesus. But if you do some counting, you will discover that there are, hmm, 13 generations. And trust me, I've counted very carefully. This is a well-known uh, issue. But maybe, I don't know, are there 13 generations or are there not? Let's learn. It says in Matthew 1, verse 17, it goes on and it adds this very crucial bit of information. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Notice 14, 14, 14. But it looked like it said 14, 14, 13. What gives? Well, the Bible says there are 14 generations. So if we're not counting it, that means we're doing something wrong. The Bible's right. But how do we reconcile it? Notice here in verse 20. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And though it doesn't quite come across in English, in Greek it is transparent, it's day. That formula there, when it says conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, is the exact same formula where in the other verses it said, so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so. Here, that which is begotten in her, is of the Holy Spirit. 
I think we might have found our missing generation. So if we went back to Matthew 1.16, notice what it reads here. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was, I'll use the word begotten to make it clearer, was begotten Jesus by the Holy Spirit. There's your extra father, as it were, who is called Christ. I think that's important. The key to the generation of Jesus Christ is not trying to, you know, look at every last detail of every last character in the lineage. It's to discover the one that is apparently missing the Holy Spirit. That's super important. If the Holy Spirit is left out of Matthew chapter 1, the generations don't work out for Jesus. You come up with 41 and you try to come up with all these clever ways of reconciling it. But if we let the Bible speak for itself, we see, oh, no, the missing link was right there like three verses later, or four verses. But guess what? In our own life, if we leave out the Holy Spirit in our life, what do you think is going to happen? The regeneration in our life isn't going to work out for us either. We're going to be missing the critical piece, right? And it doesn't matter how many gyrations we go through time to say, well, you know, this, that, and the other, it all works out. No, it doesn't. We're still missing one. And so that gets us right here to a decision. Why don't you have your short? Anyone here choose to become a son or daughter of Abraham? Okay, I'm hoping so. It's a leading question. You're supposed to say yes, but I'm hoping that you do. Now, if you are, then that means, are you willing to be circumcised without hands? Okay. That means, are you willing to be circumcised by the Holy Spirit? Okay, I hear a bunch of amens. That's great. You understand it's not always comfortable. Just because it's done without hands doesn't mean it's uncom not uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit's operation is perfect, but perfect things oftentimes hurt. Okay. Well, what about this? Do you choose to become a son or a daughter of David? Okay, well, I did. Boy, that's kind of lame. Anyone want to become a son or daughter of David? Okay, good. All right. Whew. So are you willing to become a member of God's kingdom that is cut out without hands? Okay, but remember, there's cutting. That would mean, in that case, are you willing to be filled with the Spirit so you are able to discern judgment, as Solomon said, in God's kingdom one day soon? Because aren't we going to participate in judgment when Jesus comes? I think for so for a thousand years, so let's be asking for that Spirit now. Okay, good. And then finally, this one. Do you choose to be like Jesus? Notice I didn't say, do you want to be like Jesus? I said, do you choose? You making a choice? Okay. If you see your need of the Holy Spirit, which that's what he would show you, is your need. But if you see your need of the Holy Spirit, and if you wish to be regenerated without hands, in other words, by the Spirit, if, if that's the case, I would tell you right now, take hold of Jesus' mighty hand. Did you know it's always outstretched, ready to save? He's always mighty to save, right? Take hold of it. And know this, though. You are always free to choose to let go. Right? Two can't walk together unless they are agreed. So if you choose to, you can withdraw your hand. But here's something we can be eternally grateful for. Jesus will never choose to let you go. He will let you go if you want to, but he's never going to make that choice. He's just saying, you're mine. So now, if you are making that choice tonight, to be like Jesus, to take his hand, why not raise your hand? I know that may sound Pentecostal, but that's okay. Just raise your hand. Raise it heavenward as we close in prayer. All right? Father in heaven, I know this was brief, and maybe that is ordained of you. I pray that those hands that went up, I thank you for them, but I pray that for each one that went up, I pray it would represent a sincere commitment, perhaps a, a turning back to you, and that each person here, including myself, would allow you to make the cutting. The cutting always hurts. The circumcision without hands. But if we want to be a member of your kingdom without hands, we need to let that happen. And I pray that each one here would find the, the joy and the peace that passes all understanding as they allow you to come in their life, to root out those things that have no place in your kingdom, and to put within us those character qualities, those lovely character qualities of Jesus that are not natural to us. And I pray that as that happens, that other people will begin to take note. And though they are in the world, they will recognize the difference. But rather than being repulsed, I pray that it would be the very thing that attracts them. They'd say, look, you're just, you're radiant. But really, they'd recognize the radiance is from Jesus. I pray that would draw them, and they in turn would be transformed and go forth winning more souls. We thank you for the privilege of being transformed. Please, Father, do not let us go. I ask that you would just mold us so that we'd be fashioned after the similitude of a palace.
We thank you for Jesus and this work for his sake. Amen. Thanks for joining us for our prayer meeting. Feel free to continue praying wherever you may be. If you have been blessed by our program, why not leave a special prayer request or praise report in the comments below, and we'll share it with our prayer team. May God be with you.